if you know the truth and you fail to act on it, you're really in no better position than the person who is ignorant of the truth. And in fact, in some ways, you're actually worse, in a worse position than the person who doesn't know the truth because if you know the truth intellectually, theoretically, you might convince yourself that you really do understand it and that you really are living according to it when in reality, you are just entertaining it intellectually without being committed to it. James 4.17 says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. It's sin because he knows what he ought to do and he chooses not to do, on, to do, to do it. He doesn't act on it. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32, You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth sets you free when it's known, but known in more than a mere theoretical way when it's known and acted on to know the truth about God about the world about yourself and the truth about Jesus Christ and the salvation that God provides in him is to experience true life it's to experience eternal life it's life as it was meant to be lived life in a right relationship with your creator that is these things will be yours if you know the truth in more than in a mere theoretical way. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths to teach us this vital reality about the Christian life. Specifically, he teaches us what it means to know Jesus Christ as Lord, to trust Him, to be united with Him in faith. Such a person who trusts Jesus, who is united to Him in faith, is a Christian. He has been saved. He's been secured forever by God because of what God has done in his behalf. Because God sent his only son, the Lord Jesus, and gave him up. And the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has reconciled that person to God. The person who trusts Jesus now lives in Christ. And to be in Christ is to know the favor of of God. It's to know His love. It's to have your sins forgiven. It's to be reconciled to your Creator against whom you have rebelled. And it's to know Him and His love and faith forever. And to have this, not because of what you've done, but by His grace alone. To have Christ by faith is to be guaranteed that God is for you and that nothing can ever tear you away from Him. That's the point that Paul goes to great lengths to underscore in the latter part of Romans 8. He reassures us in those last verses that God is forever for us. Our text today is Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It's found on page 944 of the Bible that's in the chair in front of you. If you'd like to use that, I do encourage you to get a copy of God's Word open in front of you because we're just going to look at these two verses today and work our way through what the Apostle Paul says in them. Since verse 31 is the beginning of Paul's concluding thoughts in this part of his letter, and those thoughts go all the way down to the end of chapter 8, I want to begin reading in verse 31 and go all the way down through verse 39, but then we'll return to verses 31 and 32 and zero in on those two verses. So hear the word of God from Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through verse 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is for us. Therefore, nothing can defeat us. That's what Paul is telling us, especially in these first two verses that I read in verses 31 and 32. And you'll note that Paul makes this point by asking questions. The section begins in verse 31 with a general question, which then is followed by six rhetorical questions down through verse 35. And today we want to look at that general question and the first two rhetorical questions as it is recorded in verses 31 and 32. The first question in verse 31, as I said, is a general one. It sets the stage for everything else that Paul is going to say through the end of this chapter. What then shall we say to these things? Now, in order to see the point that Paul is wanting us to recognize, we first need to understand what he means by these things. So we ought to ask, what things? What exactly does Paul have in mind here? Well, most certainly he has in mind the immediate preceding verses, verses 28 through 30, where we read about the security of our salvation from before creation to the everlasting future beyond time. But it could be that he's referring to what he's written thus far in the whole letter, especially beginning in verse 16 of chapter 1, all the way through verse 30. But most likely what the Apostle Paul has in mind is what he's been emphasizing in this section of the letter, the section that we find as the eighth chapter, where he has laid out for us what it means to live life in the Spirit of God, what it means to have Jesus Christ as your Lord, to be joined to him. Just look back through chapter 8 and see some of the things that Paul has in mind. Things like for Christians, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus in verse 1. Or things like in verse 11, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the the dead dwells also in us. Or the things that he elaborates in verses 13 through 16, that we are sons of God and we have received the spirit of adoption that enables us to cry out to God, Abba, Father. Or like verse 17, that we are co-heirs with Christ. Or like verses 18 through 25, that the glory that awaits us in the future is far greater. It can't even be compared to the sufferings that we experience presently. Or verse 28, that all things work together for our good. Verse 29, that God has loved us with a love that has no beginning will have no ending. That He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Or verse 30, that God has called us, justified us, and so secured our eternal salvation that in His mind He has already glorified us. Those are the things that Paul's thinking about. So what should we say to these things? Since God has done everything necessary from before time to after time to secure the salvation of his people to get us all the way home, here's what we must say. God is for us and nothing can defeat us. He's underscored the certainty of our salvation forever. Now, Paul makes this point by asking two rhetorical questions. One that's found in the second part of verse 31 And the second rhetorical question found in verse 32. Now, let me just remind you what a rhetorical question is. A rhetorical question is a literary device that's used to underscore a very important point in a stronger way than if you had just asserted it. And we use rhetorical questions all the time, right? Right? See, I just did it. Are you serious? You know, we ask that typically not wanting an answer. It's like, This is incredible. This is amazing. Or have you no shame? We don't want you to respond about whether or not you have shame. We're telling you, you ought to be ashamed. We're making a statement. Or is the Pope Catholic? 
you know, you want to affirm something real certainly, you just ask that question because everybody knows the Pope is Catholic. Well, by way of rhetorical question, in verse 31, Paul is teaching us that God will not let anyone prevail against us. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's his point. Now, when he uses this word if, he's not using it by way of doubt. This is an if of certainty. It could be read, since God is for us. And the point that he is making is because God is for us, no one can be against us. And now, Paul is not at all suggesting that Christians will not have opposition in this life, that we won't have enemies. I mean, if you just read Paul's life as it begins to be told to us in Acts chapter 9 through the end of the book, or read some of his letters like 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll see that Paul knows far better than to suggest that Christians don't ever have any opposition in this world. He will quote in just a few verses, we read in verse 36 from Psalm 44, where he reminds us that for the sake of Jesus Christ, we are as Christians sheep that are led out to the slaughter every day. Christians are constantly opposed by enemies. And the Bible minces no words about this. One of the things I love about the Bible is it's so realistic. It doesn't try to to sugarcoat reality as we experience it day in and day out in this life. The scripture tells us that we have three large categories of enemies. We have the world, the world system, this world that tries to operate as if there's no God, that then tries to draw us in with all of its seductions to live the way that it lives, to value what it values, to think what it thinks, to operate on the basis of its principles. And then we have the flesh, which is the Bible's way of describing sin that remains in us, inside of us. That sin that is constantly working against righteousness. That sin that would take us down if God were to allow it. Even the sin that remains in Christians, that the power of sin is broken in our lives. It no longer rules and reigns in us, but it remains in us. And so even for Christians, we have to acknowledge the sin that resides within us. And that's why we're exhorted, as Paul did earlier in chapter 8, to put sin to death. It's a constant battle against our Sin that remains. You think about this for a moment, Christian. Everything that you learned to do, everything that you did, you thought, you said, before you became a Christian was done in unbelief. Which means it was sinful. It was sinful. And there are patterns of sin that develop in our unbelief over years, sometimes decades. And those become our default position. And it's almost like Muscle memory. When you do a certain exercise or a certain uh, movement regularly, your muscles just recall it and you're able to do it more readily. And we have like a spiritual muscle memory that's been informed by sin that we've got to fight against, that we've got to put to death so that that sin doesn't take us off the path. And then we have the devil and all of his demons. The Apostle Paul writes about him regularly and specifically in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. This is what he says to us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, a scheming devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We have unseen, personal, powerful enemies that oppose us every day. So when Paul says, who can stand against us? Who can oppose us? He's not suggesting that we don't have enemies. He is saying that no one can destroy us. No opposition can keep God's purpose from being fulfilled in the lives of his people. No opponent will be successful in overthrowing what God is determined to do in us and for us. And we see countless examples of this in both Old and New Testaments. When we just heard David's Psalm number 27 read out loud to us. And this is exactly what David is telling us from his own testimony. If you'll note, he does it like Paul with rhetorical questions. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? No one is his point. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Nobody is his point. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries, my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, I will be confident. Well, God was for him. And David knew that. And David ordered his thought life on that basis. And he ordered his practical life on that basis. That's why he could be confident when armies marched against him. He wasn't saying, well, hey, this isn't my first rodeo. I know how to do battle. I have military prowess. No. God is for me. God has undertaken my case. And he was able to trust in God, knowing that God would not let anyone destroy him and overthrow God's purposes for him. In Numbers chapter 22 and 23, we read about this king of Moab named Balak. As Balak watched the Israelites having been delivered from Egypt cross over his territory and he saw what the Israelites had done to other nations, he got scared. And so he hired a prophet named Balaam to curse the Israelites. And so Balaam takes the king's money and then he looks out over the Israelite army and he opens his mouth to curse them. And you know what happens? He blessed them. He blessed them. And so you can imagine Balak. He said, I just paid you good money to curse them and you blessed them. And he does it three times. And every time he opens his mouth to curse and blessing results. How did that happen? Why did that happen? It happened because God is for his people. God will not let anyone destroy his people. God's purposes for his people will not fail. You remember Joseph's brothers? I mean, they sold him into slavery. They lied to their dad about him. Joseph separated from his family, separated from his home, and, and yet none of that thwarted God's purpose for Joseph. God got Joseph exactly where he wanted him to be. He raised him up to be the second most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. How did that happen? Well, it happened because God was for him. He belonged to God. His God was the true God. And God's not going to allow anything to destroy His people. Well, this truth is why Jesus says what He does to His disciples in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 10 through 12, when He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, we're blessed when we're persecuted. He goes on, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. He then says, Christians, when that happens to you, rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, this is amazing if we really believe what Jesus is saying here. He is saying when people come against us as we're following Christ and they persecute us and they revile us and they speak falsely against us for evil, what they're actually doing when they do that to us is they're moving us into the realm of God's blessing. As Jesus said, people who experience that, Christians who experience that are blessed. This is why the apostles didn't give in to fear. And depression whenever they were reviled, whenever they were persecuted in the first century. It's why we find them rejoicing in the wake of persecution. For example, Acts 5.41 says that after the apostles were beaten by the religious leaders of their day, they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Why? I mean, what's going on here? How could they do that? They could do it because they knew and they believed that God was for them and would not let anything destroy them. Brothers and sisters, this is amazing truth given to us. This is amazing reality that we must lay hold of and begin to reorient our thinking around. Because of Jesus Christ, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we need to hear what God is saying to us today.
If you're a Christian, hear this. God's for you. The God of heaven and earth, the God who created everything, the God who holds everything together right now, the God who gave up His Son for you, He is for you moment by moment. He is for you in whatever you're facing tomorrow. And if He is for you, who can be against you? No person, no thing can thwart God's purpose for His people. Oh, do you believe this? Do you really believe this? If so, then brothers and sisters, act on it. Act on it. Order your lives according to it. Trust God. Take Him at His word. Go through your life with the joy and the hope and the confidence and the freedom that comes from knowing that the eternal God is for us. And nothing, nothing will keep you from making it all the way home according to to his purposes. Well, after Paul assures us that God will not allow anything to prevail against us, he goes on and gives further assurances to us in verse 32, where he tells us that God will give us everything that we need. And again, he makes this point rhetorically by way of a rhetorical question. Look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, this is a rhetorical question that makes a logical argument. Paul is actually reasoning very logically here. The point of the question is this. Of course, God who's given us his son will also give with him everything that we need for this life and the life to come. The particular kind of logic that Paul employs here is reasoning from the greater to the lesser. If the greater is true, the lesser has to be true. If a student knows how to solve algebra problems, then she can certainly tell you the answer to the question, what is two plus two? Because she knows the greater. She's competent with the lesser. Paul is saying God's already done the greater thing. He gave up His Son for us. He sent His Son into the world to die for our sins. Because of that, He will most certainly do the lesser thing. He will give us all that we need in this life. I like the way that one commentator has put it. He writes, Since God has done the unspeakably great and costly thing, we may be fully confident that He will do what is by comparison far less. You know, here's the way the logic works. Suppose there is a wife and mother who decides that she wants to prepare an incredible meal for her family. And so she starts days in advance preparing it. She goes to the best stores and picks out the freshest products. And then she gets up early on the day of the dinner and begins all the preparation in the kitchen. She makes sure she has all of the resources available to her. She has all of the spices to give it just the right flavor. She makes sure that all of the food is cooked at just the right temperature so that everything will be perfected when it comes out of the oven and off the stove. And then she times it so that every dish will be ready at the right time in order to serve it up fresh and pleasing at the dinner hour. She puts the best tableware on her table. She puts fresh flowers as a centerpiece on the table. And when it's mealtime, the family gathers around and they look at this exquisite meal. And her son says, I don't have a fork. Well, what's the mom going to do? Well, sorry, that's your business. <laughs> no, she's done everything. She'll give her son a fork to enjoy the great work that she's done in preparing this meal. That's exactly the logic that Paul is employing here. He uses this logic not, and expresses it not by way of assertion, but by way of rhetorical question in order to drive it home to us. A woman who wouldn't spare any expense to prepare a great meal is not going to quibble over providing a fork to her son to enjoy that meal. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Well, that's the structure of Paul's argument. It's a logical argument in the form of rhetorical question. 
Let's look at the claims that he makes in this argument about God. There are three of them, three claims about God. He first tells us what God has done. God subjected his son to the full and severe punishment of sin. Now, this is stated by Paul both negatively and positively. Negatively, when he says he did not spare his own son. This, again, is an incredible statement. I mean, judges spare criminals whenever they don't give them the full weight of the law in their penalties. Parents spare children when they don't bring about the full discipline that the disobedience of the child deserves. But God did not spare His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God did not intervene in the sufferings of Jesus with any expression of mercy. Think about that. God did not intervene in the sufferings of Jesus with mercy. Let that thought sink in. And as you do, compound it with thoughts about the character of God. And further compound it with thoughts about the relationship between the Father and the Son in the Godhead. The prophet Micah says that God delights in mercy. It pleases him to show mercy. Paul in 2 Corinthians 1 calls God the Father of mercies. And we see him in the Scriptures time after time after time intervening in behalf of people showing them mercy. Yet he showed no mercy to his son on the cross. He did not spare him one drop of bitterness or suffering or agony when Jesus was on earth. The father of mercies showed no mercy to his son. Think about the relationship of the one who withheld mercy, who did not spare, and the one who was not spared. Father, son, who have lived in perfect love and fellowship, unbroken love and fellowship from all of eternity. This relationship never had a beginning. It's a relationship of perfect delight. It's a relationship that Jesus describes in John 5.20, saying the Father loves the Son, in which He confesses in His high priestly prayer of John 17, verse 24, saying, Father, You loved Me before the foundation of the world. In John 14.31, He says that the reason that He is going to the cross, the reason He's willing to lay down His life for sinners on the cross is because of His love for the Father. Think about the scene. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying under unimaginable stress, expecting, looking to his impending crucifixion, he knows what awaits him. And so he prays to his father. And Mark chapter 14, verse 36 tells us the words of that prayer. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will but what you will. Three times, Jesus prayed this prayer, pleading with His Father to take the agonies of the cross away from Him, to spare Him the sufferings of what was coming. Yet each time, He denied Himself and was willing to submit to the Father's will. And God did not spare Him. Let your mind go further to those dark hours the next day as Jesus hung on the cross. By that time, he was naked. He had been beaten, ridiculed. He was bloody. And from the cross, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This was God's own son. The, the son of his love, the darling of his soul, the joy of the father's heart. And yet because he took the place of sinners, the father would not spare the outpouring 
of divine wrath upon him. He cries out, Father, why? And God does not intervene. He did not spare his own son. When Jonah went and preached to the Ninevites in the Old Testament era, and told them that God was bringing judgment against that pagan, warring, violent, vile people, the people humbled themselves before God. And they cried out to God for mercy. And God showed mercy to those wicked people in Jonah's day. When Manasseh, who was the most wicked king in Judah's history, so wicked that he caused all of Judah to offer up their sons to pagan gods in a fiery sacrifice. When Manasseh was taken captive by the Assyrians and came to his senses, the scripture says that he cried out to God. Second Chronicles 33 records it like this. He entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his father's He prayed to him and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. The God who heard the Ninevites spared them. The God who heard Manasseh and spared him stopped his ears, turned his face away from the cries of his own beloved son and did not spare him, but caused him to experience the full severity of sin's punishment on the cross. That's what God did. But to make sure that we don't misunderstand and think that the the father just simply was passive in the death of his son by not intervening, Paul goes on, And describes to us what God did positively in the death of Christ. He didn't spare him. Verse 32 goes on. But he gave him up. He gave him up. You see the cross is the work of God. The prophet Isaiah got a preview of this. 700 years before Jesus came into the world. In Isaiah 53, 6 we read his words. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. God did it. When Peter preaches at Pentecost, he makes this same point. He said, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The question is often asked, well, who killed Jesus? Who is responsible? Listen to the way Octavius Winslow answers that question. Who delivered up Jesus to die? Not Judas for money. Not Pilate for fear. Not the Jews for envy. But the Father for love. This is what John 3.16 means. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God gave up his son and that anyone and everyone who trusts his son will never perish? It is the truth of the Bible. It is the truth that Paul is underscoring in our text. Not only does verse 32 tell us what God did, it also tells us why he did it. He did it for us. For us. The death of Jesus Christ was necessary for our salvation. God's own righteousness required it. Paul has elaborated this point previously in this letter in the third chapter. In Romans chapter 3, verse 
25 and verse 26, he puts it like this. God put Jesus forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The death of Jesus was necessary to vindicate the righteousness of God. Otherwise, God could not remain just and justify godless people. But when he takes the sin of godless people and lays it on his son and then executes his son in behalf of those godless people, he can justify them while maintaining his justice. Our righteousness is dependent upon the death of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says, For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. He knew no sin. We are sinners. And the only way that we can have the righteousness that God requires of His image bearers is if someone dies for our sins and gives us righteousness. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He took our sins upon Himself and endured God's wrath against us and the righteousness that He had earned by living an obedient life, He grants to us. And there's this great exchange that takes place between a sinner and Christ when you repent of your sin and you trust Him. This is the only way that sinners can be reconciled to God. Somebody has to pay for our sins. And that's true for everyone here this morning. Whether you're a Christian or not, someone must pay for your sins. And if you do not trust the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the payment that He has once and for all time made, then you will pay for your sin under the wrath of God forever. So we see what God did and we see why He did it. But notice verse 32 also tells us for whom he did it. For us all. All. He's not referring to every person in the world, but all the people he's been describing in this chapter. In verse 1, all those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 4, those who are walking according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Verses eight, nine, or 9, 10, and 11, those in whom Christ lives and the Spirit dwells. Verse 28, those who love God and are called according to His purpose. All, for us all, all individually. I like the way John Murray puts this. He says, within the circle of those concerned, there is no restriction or exclusion. You see, here's the truth. Each one of us has our own individual ways of sinning. Our own peculiarities that we have come up with in rebelling against God. We have each one turned to his own way. Here's the point Paul's making. What God's accomplished by giving Jesus up to death is enough to meet each believer's precise need. So are you trusting Christ today? If so, beloved, take comfort. You may think your sin is too deeply embedded in your personality. You may think your case is unique, too severe, too perverted for God to keep loving you. You may think that it's easier. It's easier for you to believe that God would love and and save others than it is that He would love and save you. But Paul says this to you. Look what God did on the cross. He didn't spare His own Son. He delivered Him up for us all. Do you trust Christ as Lord? Are you following Him? Do you love Him? He shed His blood for you. Brothers and sisters, He shed His blood for every last one of your sins. Well, this brings us to the real point of the verse. Verse 32. The promise that is embedded within us. Have you ever noticed this in verse 32? It makes an astounding promise. J.I. Packer calls verse 32 a pantechnicon promise. The pantechnicon promise of the Bible. I had to look up the word pantechnicon. It's what the British mean by a moving van. 
It's that vehicle that you put all of your valuables into when you're going from one place to another. Everything that you have, everything that you possess, everything you own goes into that van. Packer's point is that all the promises of God, everything that he provides to his children in Jesus Christ are packed into this incredible promise. By way of rhetorical question and ironclad logic, Paul tells us he promises us what God will do. He will give us all things, everything we need to get safely to heaven, to be glorified, as verse 30 puts it. Salvation is a process that we enter into when we begin to trust Jesus Christ as Lord. And this verse promises us that everything that we will need to get us all the way home will be provided to us. And he will give us all of these supplies graciously, freely. There aren't any dues that we have to pay in order to receive all things. He'll give us all things freely with Christ. You see that? You have Christ? Packaged with Christ is everything you need to make it safely home. Paul tells us God will do this and he tells us why he will do this so we can be certain that he absolutely will. He will do this because of what he's already done. This greatest work, the most improbable thing. He didn't spare his own son. He delivered him up for us all. And he did so in order that we might have everything we need for this life and the life to come. In the language of the Apostle Paul originally wrote this letter, there's an untranslated particle at least it's untranslated in most English translations. But it adds emphasis to what he says. So Young's translation, which is not well known, picks up on it and puts it like this. He who indeed his own son did not spare. Indeed. Again, it's the point. He's already done this incredible great thing, the greatest thing. Are you going to doubt that he won't do lesser things? No, it's guaranteed. It's promised, and it's promised not based upon your performance, but based upon what he's already done in Jesus. We need to remember the greatest gift God's ever given to us is not things. It's Christ. And that gift is irrevocable. It has been accomplished at great cost. and We can be sure that having given us Christ, he will give us everything else we need in this life to get all the way home. This is indeed the greatest promise that we have in the scripture. If we believe it, if we will orient our lives around it, if we will bring our emotions in subjection to it, we will find our lives full of hope and joy as we face the future. So what shall we say to these things? What indeed? If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Not your boss, not your professor, not the person that you know is trying to do you in. He cannot prevail. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Well, he most certainly will. It's undoubtable. It is sealed. It is sure. The blood of Jesus Christ guarantees it so what do you do what do you say to these things the only proper response is to say yes lord i believe and to start acting on this truth take these words seriously how can you believe these words and still doubt that god will keep eternally those whom he saves you cannot doubt it christian What will you say to these things? Will you trust that the God who's done everything necessary for your salvation is really for you? That he'll give you everything you need to successfully make it all the way home? How can we doubt God? How can we doubt his word? We should rest assured that nothing in this world, not our circumstances, not our sin, not our failures, not our opposition will be able to prevail against us and God's purposes to see every last one of us in Christ glorified. 
or my unbelieving friend? What do you say to these things? Do you believe them? Do you think that these promises could be for you? Do you doubt that God can save you? Look at what he's already done. He gave up his son for sinners. He didn't spare him. He sent him into the world to be crucified so that everyone who trusts in him might be reconciled to God forever. Trust in Jesus Christ today. You'll be saved. You'll be reconciled to God. He will become your God. He will be for you. And because the true and living God is for you, nothing will be able to destroy you in this world. So trust Christ. Turn from sin. Come to know this God today. Call upon Him. Believe Him. Take Him at His word. He will guide you all the way home. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this incredible promise that You've given to us in Christ. We thank You that if You're for us, nobody can be against us. That since You didn't spare Your own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, You will most certainly with Him give us all things. Help us to believe this. Help us to act upon this. Open the eyes of those that have never allowed themselves to enter into this amazing reality of being reconciled to you and having you, the living God, as their God. And seal these things to our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen.